Hello guys, how's it going? My name is Dal. This week we got a brand new build for the patch 11.05, which we're taking a look at earlier this week. Mostly highlighting the Dark Ranger changes for the Hunter, as well as the Ascendance Shaman updates. But these are not the only set of changes that we've seen so far in 11.05. Were you aware that Drakthir are actually getting a nerf before they get access to classes like Warriors, Rogues, Mages, Warlocks, and Priests? And were you aware that even more quality of life stuff is coming to classes like Rogues, Paladins, and Mages? And these are all of the little changes that I wanted to combine together as a little combination video about some of the other stuff that happened over in 1105 that I wanted to go over. As always, if you guys want to see more regular updates like these for future builds of War with an expansion, be sure to follow the channel and subscribe. Otherwise, let's dive in into some of the only other changes that we've seen this week on the PTR. So the first big change we see over on the PTR realms is an adjustment to the Drakthir racials. If you weren't aware, Drakthir are actually getting access to a variety of different classes from hunters, warriors, rogues, mages, priests, and warlocks. And that means that all of those classes will get access to some of the different Drakthir racials, such as their ability to glide around, which gives them a little bit more movement speed and slows down fall speed, but also some of the active racials like their knockback of Wing Buffet. And all of these draconic racials were potentially a very powerful pick going forward, especially if you enjoy participating in competitive endgame content, such as Mythic Plus Dungeons. I mean, everybody knows that Arcane Mages are really good right now for M+, but imagine an Arcane Mage with a knockup and a knockback on top of the other disruptions the class already has access to. It'll make him a Swiss Army Knife for every single dungeon and a must-have option if you're trying to be competitive. So to help reduce that feeling of necessity to switch to a drag theory going forward, they're doing a bit of tuning, which results in a couple of nerfs. Right now, over in PTR, all Drakthir will have access to Wing Buffet, but won't have access to Tail Swipe. Tail Swipe is instead going to become an exclusive ability just for the Drakthir Evoker class. But the rest of the Drakthir options will still retain an AoE Frontal Conal Knockback ability, which can be pretty good, you just don't have the knockup of the Tail Swipe that can follow up afterwards. They went a step further by also reducing their Glide ability a little bit. Previously, gliding would give you a small movement speed whenever you would start gliding, which was faster than normal running. They actually slowed down the glide's movement speed by a little bit, so it's relatively the same movement speed, and for some classes like rogues, it's actually a little bit less fast. Glide still has its own benefits, however, because it does allow you to reduce the severity of knockback abilities. So if, let's say, you're getting knocked back in one direction, you can always catch yourself with a glide to fly back to the spot you were knocked back from which helps you with dealing with displacement types of abilities. Glide is also fantastic for you to reach some of the higher places that you normally wouldn't be able to jump up to. So it has this like double jump component to it if that's how you want to look at it. It also has the obvious benefits of if you've fallen from a high place, you could always catch yourself with a quick glide in order to reduce any kind of fall damage immediately. So there's still a lot of benefits with playing drag theater and playing with a glide ability, but it no longer seems like a go-to option. Previously, I planned to go Drakthir as soon as 11.05 update dropped on my Rogue, but with this set of changes now, I'm not quite so sure. I think there's still a lot of benefits to playing Drakthir in terms of mobility and being able to counter displacement attacks and the knockback, I still think is more useful than some of the other racial options, but now it's a little bit of a tougher choice than before. And I think that's what they were really trying to accomplish with this set of changes, is to not make Drakthir as a must-have, must-play option and a guaranteed pick going forward. So I guess I want to pass it off to you guys. Are you still planning on playing Drakthir going forward? Because when you compare that glide movement speed compared to the rogue sprint speed and the fact that it slows down your movement speed if you're gliding versus sprinting, now I'm just uh, not quite so sure if situational uses of glide overlap the incredible mobility of that of a rogue. And up next, we have the Dark and Dwarves, where we actually saw a small update towards their racial ability, particularly the Mole Machine ability, which allows them to create a Mole Machine that can take them to multiple places within Azeroth. They added a couple more places where the Mole Machine can go to. Normally, a Dark Iron can only go to Ironforge, Stormwind, and Shadowforge City as a baseline option. But if you find more mole machines out in the open world, you can add them to your collection of places that you can go to. And then go to places like Kalimdor, like near the Throne of the Flame Mount Hyjal, plenty of places in Eastern Kingdom such as Airy Peak, all the way to the Fell Pits of the Outland, Ruby Dragon Channel, Dragonblight, Pandaria, Stormstar Brewery, and so many other places. But to expand the number of places that you could go with in their mole machine, they're also adding Kulturas, Zandalar, the Dragonflight Zones, as well as the Shadowlands Zones as part of the Dark Iron Mole machine locations. 
Although you'll need to first find those more machines before you can add them to your selected list of places you can go to, but it does give Dark Irons quite a few new places they can explore and teleport to instantly, which is a nice convenience feature if anything. And up next, we got even more changes for the class of Mage, which continues to get more and more love with every single build. I am so surprised we continue to get Mage buffs week after week, by the way. It is impressive just how many buffs can one class keep collecting every single update. Already, Sun Fury is a very popular choice, especially if you play the popular Arcane Mage in the Season 1. And some way, somehow, even though they keep buffing Spellslinger, they just make it Sun Fury even better with one simple change. And that is to the ability of a Gravity Lapse, where the mage snaps their fingers, knocking enemies up in the air and suspending them for a few seconds. However, recently they found a way to make this ability even stronger than ever before. Well, previously the ability would only root enemies in place, but now, when you snap your fingers, they are now instead stunned while in the air. And yes, this ability is now a proper stun, which means that they cannot use any abilities, they can't cast their spells, they can't do anything whatsoever, they just have to stand there in midair, or just float in midair. And there's nothing they can do about it. This is a change because the ability would normally knock him up in the air and then would root him in place for a short amount of time. But now with it being a proper stun, they can't attack back or do anything. So if you suspend them, they don't cast, they don't do anything. And now with it being a proper stun, it does mean that mages now have a stun, which is the one trap of crowd control that mages haven't had for a very long while since the ability to defreeze. Unless you play PvP and there's snow drift, but it takes a second and a bit of positionals to try to set up a stun, and it's not always consistent. But yeah, mages now have a guaranteed stun effect when they play with the Sun Fury playstyle, which is actually kind of huge. This is very, very strong for PvE and PvP content, specifically for Mythic Plus dungeons, where they now can suspend enemies midair and stun them fully. And in PvP, they can do this to an entire enemy team, knocking them up in the air, stunning them, and then bursting them down within a few seconds, which is a huge buff for both fire as well as arcing mages. This might maybe potentially make mages a little bit less good when pairing them together in Mythic Plus dungeons with things like demon hunters, or warriors for instance, or any class that has AoE stun. Because now that the gravity lapse is no longer a root effect but a proper stun effect, I assume it's going to be on that stun diminishing returns. So when you're playing with Chaos Nova or with Warriors that have Shockwave, that's also an AoE stun that's going to DR on each other very, very quickly. But I'm assuming the knockup effect, even if the enemy is fully stunned to yard, is still gonna happen. You just won't be able to properly stun the enemy, but you probably are still gonna be able to knock him up. And if it does that, this is still then a very fantastic type of crowd control to bring into group content. I said this before and I'll say it again. If you aren't playing a mage right now or haven't picked up a mage as an ult, you probably should at this point with how good arcane mage and frost mages are doing and how they keep buffing fire, plus all of these other mage changes that they continue to improve upon with arcane getting a variety and a flurry of brand new towns for them to play around with. They're really trying to make mage as good of a class as it can be, so if you aren't playing one as an alt at the bare minimum, then you're missing out on a class that's continued to get more love and more attention every single week. Speaking about classes that are getting some love, let's talk about Protection Paladins, which kind of fell behind a bit when it comes to the overall popularity. We took a look at the Paladin class changes a lot early over the last few weeks, and they're doing some really cool stuff, especially with some of the different capstone options and some of the more utilitarian things that could potentially make Prop Paladin much more of a support group-oriented tank in the future, which definitely amps up their viability within group content. But on top of it, they're also trying to make the protection a little bit better, not through specific talents exactly, but through some of the base gameplay and abilities. First things first, they're doing a armor buff towards protection paladins that increases the base armor by 10%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but armor it helps reduce the physical damage that you take so that's going to give them a little bit extra fortification against physical damage which is probably the most common damage type within dungeon and raid content also the cooldowns of some of the basic abilities such as a blessed hammer as well as judgment and hammer of the righteous although this ability's base cooldown has been reduced by 10 percent which means that you can use these abilities a little quicker to build up the holy power a little faster in order to be able to get your bearings and get your defenses up a little and as you're able to build up resources just a little bit quicker, they also are increasing some of those resource spenders, such as the armor gain from the Shield of the Righteous ability. 
increasing the armor gain from this effect by 10%, which gives you a much better mitigation rate, increasing your overall armor against physical damage. And with the fact that you can generate holy power a little bit faster, it does allow you to maintain this ability at all times without any gaps between your defenses. Another change they've done is actually take a look at one of their talents, specifically the one who plays with the Aya tier, which is in most light, and they increase its cooldown reduction rate. It says on the troll tip that they increase the cooldown reduction from 20%, which is actually 25% on live, to 33%. So Aya tier comes back off cooldown just a little bit faster, with Aya tier being quite a powerful defensive option for protection paladins in general, offering 25% damage reduction for 6 seconds, making it one of your first defenses that you should be probably utilizing as aggressively as possible with such a short cooldown. There's even some synergy between Templar and Protection Paladin because the Templar ability allows you to play with the IoT ability to replace it with a Hammer of Light, which calls down a massive hammer dealing a bunch of holy damage as well as additional holy damage to nearby allies, and then continuing to strike the enemy down with Empyrean Hammers afterwards. Now the playstyle of Templar may benefit a little bit from this cooldown reduction with the Emos Light, though Templar and Protection are kind of in a weird state right now, because Templar is very aggressive over here in spec that doesn't offer as many defensive options as someone like Lightsmith does for Protection, which makes Lightsmith a little bit better of an option, but the cooldown reduction in high tier could make Templar and the damage based gameplay a little better. Though I would like to see Templar get some kind of obvious defensive options for Protection, so it could be a powerful damage component, while also providing some sort of defense for Protection in the long run. Jumping back on my Evoker Rogue, we actually see a pretty sizable, it's a one singular change come to Rogues, but it's actually quite massive, and that is the ability of Faint, if you look at it here, if you have keen eyes, you'll notice that it's actually off the GCD now, so you can use Faint in between of other abilities at the same time. This is massive because Faint is a fairly big component of Rogue survivability, providing us with a 40% damage reduction from area of effect attacks. So any raid-wide damage, group-wide damage, Rogues can almost avoid it and in some cases make it basically Rogues can avoid a huge portion of that damage, which increases our overall survivability. Previously, though, it was on the global cooldown, so we had to make the choice between building those combo points or spending them, or press and faint. In most cases, you would have to just settle down and press faint just to survive mechanics, but now you can continue your rotation and then weave faint in in between of your attacks. This becomes even more powerful for any rogues that utilize Elusiveness, a talent that allows Evasion and Feint to also give us 20% damage reduction to non-area of effect attacks. So anything that targets the rogue or any direct damage to the rogue or anything that doesn't count as a raid-wide group-wide damage, we can now reduce that damage by 20% with Feint. This is a very popular talent to use in Mythic Plus, especially if you're getting targeted by boss abilities or damage over time mechanics. This makes rogues super, super tanky, but also it's a fantastic option within PvP content as well. And now that rogues can weave faint in between of their abilities, you can now better line up when you need faint during specific defensive options, as long as you have the energy for it. It was the most annoying part as a rogue though, like doing your opener when you sink in all that energy into your burst damage. And then if let's say a boss ability can comes out shortly in between of you using your entire burst. If you wanted to survive it, you would have to sacrifice a global to press faint, which didn't feel that good before. But now you can weave that faint in between of your full burst rotation in the opener and not have to worry about it whatsoever, as long as you can manage the energy, since faint still does cost a little bit of energy, 25 specifically. But this is a nice quality of life change and I think rogues will look forward to for a very, very, very long while and it's going to make us even tankier going forward. But as much as I like to hit you guys with so much good news and buzz, sometimes I have to hit you with some nerfs and the class of warrior is seeing some nerfs as of this week. The AoE of Warriors has been a very, very powerful component of this class. We saw this during the uh, the raid progression of Queen Anserek on Mythic. We saw this throughout the entire tier so far of the Norubian Palace, but also there's a good chance of seeing how well Warriors are doing with an AoE content. They are the masters of big AoE burst damage, and it looks like they are putting a bit of a cap on that damage output. Certain Warrior abilities, only specific ones, are being nerfed with this update. One being Thunderous Roar. The ability itself isn't doing less damage per se, but they are reducing its soft cap from five targets, from eight targets to five targets. 
And the other day I had somebody ask me, what does soft cap even mean? Like the difference between soft cap and hard cap. So I'm going to demonstrate it here with a Tuscar dummy. So normally when you have an ability that hits, let's say a soft cap of five targets, that means it's going to hit first five targets in front of you, like all of these targets around me here. When I hit them with an ability, it's going to do full damage to everything around it. So all of these trade dummies right now are taking full damage from a whirlwind and there's no reduction being done to any of those targets. But let's say if I were to add a six target into the list back here, I'll add a Toshkar train dummy as a six target. This means the first five targets that I hit, which are going to be these train dummies, all of them take full damage. You'll see the Tosca train dummy is also getting hit by abilities as you'll see numbers popping up all around it. But that train dummy is the sixth target and it takes reduced damage from my AoE ability, which means that Whirlwind still can impact and affect that target, especially if I use big AoE abilities, like if I had Cleave, for example, because I can put up the mortal wounds or deep wounds bleed on all of these targets. So certain dot mechanics would be good there. But if I'm Whirlwinding and I'm hitting all of them at the same time, only first five would take a full damage. That last one is taking some damage, but not as much. So this means abilities such as Thunder's Roar will bleed everybody, but first five targets are going to take the most amount of damage from the bleed, but the one back there isn't taking as much damage as the rest. So that's what we mean when we say you five target soft cap. Another ability that's hit by this five target soft cap is the warrior's warbreaker ability. This is usually arms warrior's big burst ability that snaps all that aggro to you immediately. But apparently warbreaker will also now have a five target soft cap where it still deals very strong very immediate damage as soon as you press it but what are the targets be but anything beyond five targets is going to take reduced damage from this ability. Another warrior ability that's also seen this reduction in terms of its overall soft cap decreases is the Fury Warrior's Odin's Fury ability. Another burst effect that is also being reduced from an eight target soft cap down to a five target soft cap, which like the other abilities is going to deal less damage to anything outside of your main five target range. This does mean that Odin's Fury is still going to hit everything around you, just some targets are going to take more damage while the rest are going to take less damage from this ability, which limits its impact in larger AoE pool AoE situations. This means that the AoE reductions are finally hitting Warriors. I don't think it's going to make Warriors all of a sudden a bad pick when it comes to AoE content and Mythic Plus content. I still think they're going to be very, very potent for that specifically but i guess no king rules forever so warriors are taking a bit of a hit this time around over on the ptr and that's something to note this is just a ptr change that hasn't hit the live realms just yet so if you're playing your warrior aoe to your heart's content right now before they cap the ability for you to be an absolute menace within mythic plus content and with that, that's going to make up the entire list of class changes that we've seen so far over on the 1105 PTR. As always, I want to thank all of you guys so much for watching this update and I hope all of you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it or found it informative, go ahead and give this video a like. I would very, very much appreciate it. Join our Discord community to continue the discussion of all of these class changes over with the rest of the community. And also let me know all your thoughts in the comments down below. And as always, I'll see all of you guys in the next one.